Hey, I'm Nick DiMatteo, and welcome to video number 88 and audio season four, episode 29 of Music is Not a Genre. Thank you, as always, for listening and watching. Don't forget you can support this podcast at patreon.com slash music is not a genre, where you get exclusive video and music and input into what other podcasts I do, among other things. Uh, as features for being a patron, you can also support at anchor.fm slash music is not a genre. It's free to sign up there, but donations are absolutely welcome. And my hub, my public hub is youtube.com slash Nick DiMatteo, where you get almost everything I do. Uh, please also visit the channels page there because uh, along with my podcast, of course, I am a musician uh, for my band Rec. And I have been releasing new music videos all year. Uh, just released one this week, as a matter of fact, for the song Don't Say You Don't, which I'm very excited about. And please go up and sign up there at the Rec page, the Rec channel on YouTube. And yes, please visit nickdematio.com to see everything else. If you go to nickdematio.com slash podcast, you get all of this content here too. A few new things this week, let's get to the topic first. Mixes and the CDR. At some point, we were all pirates. So for those of you watching, you know what? For those of you listening, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do you guys first because I don't often do that. For those of you listening, you may hear a difference. And that is because I have been working on my tech in the background, and things have been moving along quite well this year, this past whole year, and I wanted to honor that by continuing to upgrade where I could. So I am recording dual audio, for those of you who know, and one would be here on this uh, iPhone that I'm using for my video, uh, and for a while I was using a wireless mic, which was working pretty well, that busted and also wasn't perfect. So I'm now using an actual microphone here, recording a second track, which I will use for my audio. And uh, that's why if you are watching, you will see that there is a microphone here because hey, let's face it, this is an actual podcast, right? And I don't have a studio. Part of the reason why I ask for your support all of the time is because I'm just doing this from my home in the basement of my duplex apartment in Astoria, New York, and setting it up as best I can, but being a, you know as close to a studio as it can possibly be, to give you the quality content that I like to create and that I like to share with you, in hopes that that you know you're the kind of person who values content over everything else. But that being said, I'm always looking for ways to improve. So the more support. I get the more I'm able to invest in what I do. Uh, either way, I'm going to keep doing these. So after that, let me just remind you of uh, the topic here, uh, especially if you're just listening. If you're watching, you can see this incredible setup that I have. Mixes and the CDR. At some point, we were all pirates. So there's that pirate joke. <laughs> and uh, I... I have a lot of opinions about this, as I do, you know, in general about these things. But I wanted to start by kind of giving you the layout here, which is that this is going to be a combination of the history of music piracy. History, very, not even the complete history, just parts of the history. The history of my mixes, which you see many of in front of you, many, many, I haven't even counted, maybe we'll get a count. And... The conclusion to this, to me, uh, prior to talking about my song, is what's the real piracy? Who are the real pirates? And I think that that makes this entire episode worthwhile right there, if you stick around for that part of the conversation. So for those of you who know me, you know that I have been a, a DJ since my teen years, if not before then, I honestly can't remember before then. And I started by bouncing songs from one cassette player to another. Uh, anybody who's familiar with uh, the cassette era will know what that means. Uh, I then graduated to buying a mixing board from a place on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia and mixing uh, th you know, through that board using two turntables, using a cassette player, uh, much, much, much later down the line, a CD player as well. Uh, and that, of course, gave it a better quality and the whole thing. 
And then I took that uh, pretty concurrently with that live with a DJ partner of mine. We made home mixes, many of them, which we took to parties or just enjoyed ourselves, some of which you actually see here. Uh, if you're watching on top of this Victrola, there are a ton of cassettes. Uh, we also did, you know, parties in school, like school dances and things like that. I DJed somewhat through college and then continued to make my own party and specialty mixes through the years of uh, various, uh, probably right up until the streaming era, at which point, uh, you know, and I've talked about this before, I moved to playlists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, that is sort of the, the, you know, the mini history of why I'm doing this at all and why you see what you see in front of you. And then huh, everything changed. And here's what I mean by that. So prior to mid-late 90s, late, let's say the late 90s, things were pretty fluid in the sense that you needed external, you know, technology, actual rig, gear, to create mixes. And then that depends, of course, on what kind of mix you were creating. I talked about this before, so just to briefly touch on it, you have mixes which i think most people think of as mixes because when you make mixtapes and things like that and yes these are genuine mixtapes and mix cds which are not mixtapes but i guess they are and that would mean that you just sequence songs you very thoughtfully usually sequence songs based on the objective you're trying to achieve you're in love with somebody there's a party whatever it is and i'll talk about some of the ones that are up front here uh on my uh, diorama or you could be the kind of mixer that actually mixes. In other words, you're cross-fading from one song to another. You're adding little elements of surprise and things on top of other songs, little punch-ins. And uh, I did both of those. I had a ton of fun doing both, but especially the cross-fade because that's kind of where my background was. And even when I had two cassette players, you know, it was manually turning down a sound to turn up the you know next song and that kind of a thing. Crossfading has been around since I think at least the 70s. And that book that I talked about last night at DJ Save My Life will give you a whole history of that. Now, why do I say everything changed at a certain point? Well, let's take a look at what I have here. Uh, this is a great illustration. So I have top left to top right in rough chronological order a bunch of mixtapes that I've made. Bottom left to bottom right, chronologically, mix CDs. And they span from the mid-1980s to the mid-2000s. So about 20 years worth of mixes. There were a couple I couldn't find. There were a couple that I gave away and et cetera, et cetera. But this is a pretty good representation of the mixing that I've done that I've been able to actually keep and archive and all of that. You, you don't see the first mix I ever made. Uh, I think actually, I don't think it was the first mix, but it was the first mix I made to give to somebody else. And that was a huge Beatles fan. I took my dad's uh, original Beatles vinyl uh, the American uh, release albums and created a sequence that I enjoyed, made a copy of it, cassette copy, and gave it to my parents to listen to in the car for me to listen to when they would drive me in the car because I couldn't drive at the time. And that's the one I remember as being, you know, kind of seminal. But there were a couple before then, and that was through that kind of cassette, you know, punching in kind of thing with the two cassette players and all of that, or just stopping a cassette, recording something, however you wanted to do it. That's what some of these are. Now, let's take a look at the first uh, thing here. I like to show this, and this will probably be my graphic for this episode. I haven't done that yet. But you see this that is a character that I created, pretty much just exists on this cassette, but it, it seems like he has a life beyond that, Nikki D. And if you look very closely, again, video uh, the, for the video people, you will see that the mask is an N, 
the neck and the that little ear thing and the nose is the I, and then you have a body C, the arms and legs are the K, the two feet are the E's, and that mysteriously opening door in his fist is the D. So that's Nikki D. And this is also a mix. It's a mix of a whole bunch of songs such as, uh, well, AJ Scratch. I mean, Curtis Blow. And I've talked about that before. But then it goes on into Cruel Summer, Bananarama, Shackles on My Feet, Beatbox, It's Yours, is a song that came back to me again about two years ago. I heard it in um, like a juice shop. And I was like, yeah, whoever's got this playlist going is awesome because you don't hear that often. Uh, Erotic City, uh, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, Happy Trails, which I think was the Van Halen, Hard Habits to Break uh, from Chicago, uh, The Rhythm of the Night. Excellent song, uh, if you remember that. And that's a great representation of the kind of mixes that I would make, mostly for my own pleasure. And of course, if you see here, well, let's let's do a quick count. So there's seven here. There's seven here. That's 14. And this first one, you'll notice with the red marker, those are the earliest ones. I have this one, Through Time with Nikki D. That was kind of my uh, chronological. I don't remember what's on it. I can play it because I have a cassette player here, and I may talk about that at some point. But it's you know, songs in chronological order up until that point, which would have been about the late, you know, mid late eighties. And that's another seven here. A lot of these are just collections. Let me pull this out and you'll see the red marker of the earlier ones. And then I went to kind of blue pen. It's silly to talk about this stuff, isn't it? But if you grew up in this era, you understood the value of good art and good labeling and all of that. And I was fairly good at labeling through the 90s, when I was still making cassettes, I would even try to copy the artwork of the uh, CD that I was... And the reason I did that was because at the time I had a car with a cassette player but no CD player, and I didn't have that attachment with that fake cassette that would allow you to play CDs and blah, blah, blah. Fun stuff. So I would make cassette copies of things that I wanted to listen to on my rides in between teaching kids piano in their homes That was an era. And you'll notice that a lot of this is hip hop. And a lot of it, and I tried to filter some of these out, but I think they're in there, came from me listening to uh, Power 99 FM in Philadelphia. They, on Sundays, I believe, they would have mix uh, guest DJs come in and do mega mixes and things like that. And they would pop in songs you wouldn't normally hear. So I'd try to capture them. And that's what a lot of this is. And some of it's just, you know, like, here we go, run DMC. DMC and a DJ run, dum diddy dum diddy diddy dum dum, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get to these, which were uh, another, what's that? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, so eight. So that's 22, 23, 24, 25, that's 27 tapes, which is not all of them, but it's close, of mixes. You know, you can see how obsessed I was. And some of these were themed. As you can see, there's punk, there's rock and roll, there's dance. There's this one, music in plaid, which the, that was something that uh, my DJ partner and friend and I came up with, which was the idea that uh, music is not a genre. Basically, is kind of where it started. You know, you think of, think of plaid as a visual. And we were mixing together songs that you would think, well, maybe they shouldn't go together. So even back then, that was something. It was a sign of the times from Prince. Running, running so hard to find you, running so fast. Good uh, techno song. Bad Rock City from Big Audio Dynamite. Don't Need a Gun. Sunday Bloody Sunday in the Name of Love With or Without You. A little little U2 rock block there. Uh, If you want In Your Dreams Tonight, Agent Orange. How Soon Is Now from The Smiths. Could You Be The One from Husker Du. Uh, Boys Don't Cry from The Cure. Added Up, Violent Femmes. Also Heartache, Kiss Off, I Hear the Rain, Blister in the Sun, Never Tell, Promise. (laughs) I'll say all that. So uh, Violent Femmes. And then you have Every Little Counts from New Order, one of my favorite songs. And ending with Sort of Homecoming from... Uh, you two music and plaid is kind of a wow you know and then this was another similar one which I think we actually made for a party called killer traveling band tape some fearsome kinds of party trash thrash sometimes coming up with a good title can make all the difference Uh, and then here we have 
this. Now, this this last is the fourth era of my cassettes, really out of five. And the fifth was what I talked about, you know, kind of creating uh, cassettes from CDs, just for my own listening pleasure. We would have Halloween parties. And every other year, for whatever reason, I think I like to accumulate, you know, and reuse. And, you know, it's, it takes a long time to make these things when you're crossfading and such. Uh, I would make mixtapes for parties. So this one, first one is from 1992, Alternative Pulses, Drab and Cease Cuts. And that's just a funny way of using the first initials of certain songs. And so that's what it's called. And then 1994, Whack H Party Mix, Whack H Party Mix 2. 1996, How It Is, Halloween, 96. Uh, and then Keeping It Tight on Fright Night, 1998, I right? So that's what that says. Um, and, then, and then 2000 came, and a couple of things happened. And that's why I'm going to transition now to some uh, more informational stuff and less personal things. Uh, one is, I had my first child. And... That slows things down tremendously for anybody who's a parent, especially if you're a stay-at-home parent like I was at that time. But the second thing is, around that time, mid-late 90s, early O's, but really mid-late 90s, four things converged, four technological things converged. You had the internet, which, depending on who you ask or how you're gauging it, has been around since 69 with the Arp ARPANET uh, but in 1983, when TCP IP protocol uh, was introduced, that, that really changed the game in a lot of ways. And 1989 was when the World Wide Web was introduced, which is really when things kind of gelled. And of course, it took several years, you know, and all that era of like, you know, free AOL discs to, you know, that's how a lot of people got online through their phone modem before digital and all that stuff, cable. And... That was, you know, the th a thing that by the 90s was pretty robust. And then the CDR or CDRW, so uh, record rewritable. The first CD burner was introduced in 1988 and it cost, uh, well, in 19 it was developed in 1988. In 1991, it sold, uh, that type of machine sold for about $35,000. And by the late 90s, it was down to around 200. And I've been told that now you can get one for 20 or $30. But why would you need one? Because if you have a desktop computer or a laptop with a port, you can uh, be assured that there's software there that will burn the CD for you, you know, and, and that's mostly what I did after a certain point, and I'll get to that. And that third thing that, that converged technologically was the MP3 and, or the Wave. MP3s were introduced in 88 and the Wave in 91. These, these are compressed files where you take an amazing quality audio, compress it down to not a very good quality, but much easier to share and all of that. Uh, and the wave is about 10 times bigger and, you know, considerably better audio wise than the MP3. If you ever listen to Tidal, as opposed to Spotify, you will hear a big difference in quality. Uh, it will be a perfect example. But in the 90s, uh, the internet and computers were both way too slow and weak for WAV files, so MP3s, you know, ruled the day. It's why it was so important, and they became pretty ubiquitous at the time, especially when it came to file sharing, which is the fourth thing. And file sharing has been around in some way since the 1970s through modems. Uh, but again, it was the 1990s when it really took hold, and it was the early to mid 2000s when the whole thing blew sky high. Now you could find file sharing before then, and I certainly did in many ways. But you know there were certain companies that came about, legal and mostly illegal piracy, that uh, made it way easier and made more way more ubiquitous. And that would be companies like MP3.com, which started in '97. I actually had music of mine on mp3.com within the first couple of years. Napster, which everybody knows about, if you know that history, in 99, uh, did not survive very long in its original form. 
but is still around today. And I'll get back to that uh, later. LimeWire in 2001, Kazaa in 2001, which coincided with the BitTorrent protocol in 2001, which were the places you would go, among many others, uh, and FrostWire was one that I went to and LimeWire was shut down, where if you were looking for either software or music and, and I guess videos as well, you, you could go there and get it for free. And, and of course, that was not legal. And so a lot of that was shut down. Um, but, but the reason why I brought it up now is because if you take a look at the bottom tier of my diorama here, you'll see CDs and you will see two sections. You'll have the first one here, which believe it or not, every single one of these uh, almost was made. Uh, the first batch was made in 2002. I think that was my way of saying I'm coming back after the, missing the year 2000 with the kid. Uh, and I did a Nix mix, uh, a two part, uh, uh, sorry, a three part here. And then I did these two, the best of the rest, best of the rest one and two, which were for my brother's, uh, 30th birthday that year. And then I did, uh, another three CD mix, uh, mix one, two, and three, 2004. So it was me trying to kind of keep up with things. But then also that year I had my second kid. So that probably is one reason why I think slow down. Although I remember making mixes uh, for my uh, children in 2005. I made one in 2009. So I did keep that up for a while. But what I really transitioned to was finding as much music as I could for as little money as I could. And I did that in this way. Pandora debuted. Was it 05, 06? I don't remember. I was, uh, you know, programming my stations there and loved l listening to and hearing songs that I hadn't heard before and would mark down what they were. And then I would go to Kazaa or LimeWire or FrostWire and find them, if I could find them, get a copy, and then I would make uh you know collections these are not really mixes these are more collections but they kind of go to the main topic here i have two entire cds of emo screamo and power pop i have two entire cds of mellow music but a third one which says it's more techno uh and this was all around i want to say 0506 uh punk and garage rock dance and weird robotic shit new way new new wave one New New Wave 2, Jangly Indie Pop 1, Jangly Indie Pop 2, Indie Ecology Rock 2. I can't find Indie Ecology Rock 1, but I did that. So you have here 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 12, if you count the missing one, 13 CDs of pirated music. Uh, I don't know what the statute of limitations is on that. But let's face it, if you're past a certain age, we were all pirates. And at the time... Uh, during that really what ended up being a fairly brief period, less than a decade, I was a music pirate and I was happy to be one. I would not otherwise have heard a lot of this music because I couldn't afford it all. And most of it wasn't played on any radio and internet, you know, radio and streaming didn't exist then. And even early streaming, you wouldn't find everything. And, you know, we all realize now that that kind of piracy was a bad idea, right? Or do we? Do, do we realize that? Or is there a different way to look at it? And this is where kind of the crux of this comes along. Yeah, I, I want to give credit to a guy named Joseph Langdon who put uh, up a page, a site, that I linked to in my text here below that went through the history of music piracy. And I'm not going to go through all of it, but there were a couple points that popped out that I just thought were interesting. One is that people have been bootlegging sheet music as early as the 19th century. When that was the only way to get songs, they would find ways to you know, get the sheet to a song without having to pay for it. Uh, but believe it or not, sound recordings weren't even covered by copyright law until 1972. And if you remember my episode on sampling, uh, Danger Mouse and all of that, you know, that 
was not outlawed in in its current state until the early 90s, really. So it took a while for the law to catch up to technology, as it always does. As you may remember, with uh, music piracy, with the you know Napster and all of that, it took a couple of years for people to catch up. And we remember, if you remember, uh, that during that era, around 99, 2000, when Napster really kicked off, and was becoming very popular and well-known, Metallica raged against music piracy, this this kind of theft. And then record companies and and all that kind of came up behind there, or concurrently, and sued the hell out of Napster, shut them down. Napster eventually became legit. It's been revamped and bought out a few times. It still exists now. And like I said, I have one more comment to make about Napster later. And I want to give you my kind of sense of how it felt at the time. Because I'm not just a fan. And I'm not just a person with, you know, integrity and all of that. I'm a musician. I'm a music creator. So from the fan side... If you're just a mercenary fan, you say, well, the most music I can get for free, awesome. Uh, If you have some integrity, okay, I will pay for as much as I can, but those of us who aren't rich and who love music to death can't maybe pay for everything that you'd like to. This is, I'm talking like 20 years ago. When you're a musician, you know, you would think, okay, everybody's stealing my music. I'm losing money, blah, 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 blah. No. And no, I didn't feel that way. Uh, as a matter of fact, had one of my early MP3 songs become so popular during the era of, you know, Napster and BitTorrent and LimeWire and all of that, that it was being passed around millions of times for free, I would have freaked out in a good way. Because my objective here has always been to share. My objective has always been to share my music, share my thoughts, but to share my music ultimately. And any way that it gets shared is wonderful. Now, the, there's a difference here, which is that when you're uh, struggling or a musician or a musician that doesn't make a lot of money from royalties and things, you do want every penny. So it, it does you know, hurt smaller musicians more and I'll, I'll weave this into what's happening now very soon. When you're a musician like Metallica, honestly, I was insulted. Uh, I understood their point, but they were already making so much money that it seemed mercenary in its own way to take music away from the fans when the, I think, comparison between the money they were making and the money they were losing was, there there just was, they were making far more than they were losing, which I think was the case with most of those bands, you know, and let's face it, even today, people are getting music for free uh, through things like uh, free online software that lets you rip MP3s from YouTube videos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so many other ways. So there's still that kind of piracy that exists, but the world is looking on it more kindly now for a couple of reasons. And one is that again, uh, the people are making money are making money, and the people that aren't uh, aren't, and neither of them are being hurt that much by this kind of ripping, the seed, the burning, and the ripping of the CDs and the MP3s, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the second thing is, and this is where the main point, the, really the reason why I did this at all, than the, other than the fun of talking about my old mixes, and that is that music piracy didn't die in its early form because it was outlawed. It didn't die at all, as I said. You know, you have YouTube, but it's, it is probably an infinitesimal uh, amount compared to what it used to be. And that's because it died because music and tech companies got wise. They caught up. They understood that if they entered the game in a certain way, they would rule or do their their best to rule again. And that's what they did. You had tech companies like Pandora and and Apple uh, eventually, you know, I think the first, uh, let me just double check in here. Uh, with my notes, I don't know, I don't see it, but I, I believe that the first streaming service 
was Rhapsody and then iTunes. And in those were, I think Rhapsody was late 90s and then early iTunes, early O's. And then, of course, everything else that came after that. And they are partnerships, make no mistake, between these technology companies and the record companies, the music companies, the companies who own and distribute this music. And to me, they're the real pirates. That's where the real piracy is happening. We've heard a lot about Spotify in recent, uh, you know, if you're listening in, uh, this is early 2022, because of the Joe Rogan controversy and censorship or lack of censorship or whatever it is, however you fall, uh, you know, if you think Joe Rogan is, a, is a, uh, an idiot who's saying certain things just to make money and, and keep the fans he has, whether they're factual or not and is very insulting, et cetera, et cetera, or if you happen to be a fan of his. What people don't talk enough about, which hopefully they're starting to talk about more, is that the bigger crime for something like Spotify, and Spotify is one of the biggest culprits of all. There are charts out there online that tell you uh, how much royalties uh, each song garners the artist or the owner of the song, you know, publisher, or what have you, uh, and Spotify is one of the lowest, really. And that, to me, is where the piracy happened. It's when these companies said, we're going to make money hand over fist through downloads, through streaming, most especially, through monthly you know, uh, subscriptions at various tiers and with various companies, and, and many of us have multiple, you know, uh, companies or streaming services that we use and give as small a pittance as possible to the artists, which is exactly what is happening in most cases. The amount that you would get for a song from radio play through your performing rights organization like BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, would be fairly decent back in the day, there is no comparison today. Even the best streaming services that pay the highest royalties don't come close to what you would get then. Uh, so, you know, that's that's one thing that changed quite a bit. You had companies like A&M and the Recording Industry Association of America, again, 99 and 2000, who started all this with Metallica and sued and the end result is we're over 20 years later and they are all making way more money, you know, than any of the independent musicians out there just trying to make ends meet, you know. And that's why piracy died. Piracy died be, was because the, the, the pirates became robber barons. Robber barons took over the situation. Can you still find free music? Oh, God, Yes. Yes, you can, but it is so much easier to just subscribe to a service for a cheap amount per month and find almost every song that you could ever want. And if you can't find it on a streaming service, you go to YouTube and 99.9% .9 of what you're looking for is there. And that's free, especially if you use one of those softwares and just grab the song or if you just make a playlist on YouTube, you know. That's what, that's what killed piracy. Piracy would still be uh, super, super alive and well today if not for companies that were already making a ton of money cashing in. Now, granted, they were scared. They were losing money because physical sales were dying. But as has been historically true ever since the record companies, you know, and even before then, the artist would get as little as possible unless the artist had some kind of power or pull to get a better deal. And who does that? Artists like Drake and Taylor Swift, who I'm, I'm not panning, you know, at all. But they're going to get deals where their streaming per stream is higher than other artists. So even though these companies have made music consumption super convenient, they've, they've honestly improved the experience for both the listener, and the companies themselves. So as a listener, I've been thrilled because I've been able to make playlists and find music for, I mean, hand over fist way more than I would ever have listened to back in the day for very, you know, the, the price of less than, let's say, let's just say one CD per month. I can listen to thousands. 
if I have the time, thousands of CDs, you know. But, you know, when when music pirating was peer to peer, there was this kind of sense of sharing and love of music. And that's, you know, why I was not upset by that idea it wasn't just because i was a listener and i wanted the music it was because i would have been op- honestly flattered if that kind of sharing was occurring with my music and now the robber barons the big companies are the ones who are profiting so it's not better for everyone it, it it's worse for musicians it's worse for music creators and let's let's go over that let's in fact get this get this downloads you know, you'll get more money per download as a creator. But let's just go to streaming. The best, or one of the best streaming services for royalties for musicians is Napster. The existing Napster, which is owned by a different company now, I forget what it is, but it's still called Napster. You're going to get almost $8 per thousand streams. Now, again, pales in comparison to what you would have gotten when you, you know, get something on the radio, uh, let's say if it was even a penny a play on the radio, then that's $10, you know, um, Apple comes fairly close to that. It's about, it's almost $7 for a thousand Spotify, $2, a little over $2, $2.29 per thousand from the chart that I saw. I'm sure it fluctuates, but on average for a thousand plays, you're getting a little over two bucks. Um, the best are apps, you know, even better than Napster, Amazon Unlimited and YouTube Red, which are, you know, more expensive subscription services. They do actually reach about one cent per stream. So they're, they're kind of more in the tradition of what you might get. Uh, and the worst by far, TikTok, you get less than a dollar per thousand streams. Just, just absolute theft. Add that again, that's piracy. You know, that is piracy. And that's my story. And that's that's the that's my opinion on all of this. And I hope that that encourages you to find places that have the highest quality sound like Tidal. And uh, I think maybe YouTube Red, I'm not sure. And the highest royalty per streams. Because if you love music, you also love the musicians who make it by default. You'd want to support them, and that's a way to do that. Uh, kind of hard to link a song to this. I could link so many, whether it was the DJ angle or you know something else. But I chose a song from my band Rex album, Go- uh, Parts and Labor, called Gold, because my uh, quarterly royalty reports show that Overall, it's gotten close to a million plays and streams on streaming services on iHeartRadio and all of that stuff. And so here I am doing this podcast asking for your support. Here I am having put out a dozen albums and so much music over the years. And I say a number like a million for a song. And you would think, hey, yay, hooray. That has netted me about a hundred dollars and that's over several years so that does yes that no that is absolutely not right and that's where we are and that's where we are in a lot of industries in the world right now so what i encourage you to do is i'm going to of course put gold at the end of this uh video and audio and enjoy it and thank you but also can you click on the link to the band camp version of gold uh, the rex Bandcamp page and listen to gold there or download it for a buck uh you know because as i've said before Bandcamp gives more royalties to its artists than pretty much any company out there and thank you in advance for doing that uh do you connect at all with this history did you used to make mixtapes back when cassettes were the thing did you make a lot of mixed cds uh, have you made a mix of a physical mix you know, like that at any point in recent years? Or is everything just, uh, you know, playlists and streaming? Does it bother you that musicians get so little for the work they do, which 
already wildly successful companies, you know, or get or pocketing most of the money? Are you even still willing to buy and own music, such as the download I suggested for the song Gold at Rex Bandcamp page? Or are you content with just streaming? Because keep in mind that depending on what service you use, you may not actually own the music at all. And that may bother you, may not bother you. Ownership is kind of a funny thing with people. Uh, I'd love to know your opinion on that. I'd love to know your opinion on any of this stuff because as always, my objectives here are music, conversation, and connection. I hope you have enjoyed uh, this uh, new tech version of the podcast here and this kind of, uh, you know, slightly freewheeling version with all the crazy talk about mixes and everything. And as always, I will talk to you next week. I had a chance, I had a chance to take you to my soul. I had a chance, I had a chance, I took it, now it's gold. Oh, it tingles in my fingers and in my toes. Oh, the jingles I was singing If you could be so like gold It's gold I had a chance, I had a chance I had a chance I took it Now it's gone Oh, it tingles in my fingers And in my toes Oh, the jingles I would sing If you could be so Sing if you could be sure